the data made us do it. There is no such thing as data-driven decision. Recovering from wintertime illness, I am returning to form on this substack by reacting to the latest thing that caught my ire on the internet. This time, the article, Men Have Abandoned Marriage and Parenthood, from the blog Graphs About Religion. I encountered this piece in Aaron Wren's excellent newsletter, and given that it touched on one of our mutual interests, the problem of relationships and family decline in the 21st century, I read the whole thing in detail, despite Wren's disclaimer concerning the blue-pilled assumptions. But blue-pilled assumptions only scratch the surface, since the analysis contains huge problems in its methods, less numerical than its philosophical approach to tackling hard problems with data. The author, Ryan Burge, seems like a nice guy. While I don't want to completely trash the man's work, I have to say that the article is a perfect picture of statistically backward thinking. It's not just that the assumptions behind the model are blue-pilled. The entire approach falls into a pattern I have been observing for some time in how journalists and laypeople talk about data analysis, especially in the wake of large language models and AI. In broad strokes, Mr. Burge attempts, like many before him, to isolate the cause of family decline in the post-2012 world. To do this, he imports a large cross-sectional matrix from the Cooperative Election Study on Marriage. He isolates a single label, never been married, and then takes broad hacks across the set, longitudinally, adjusting for several key factors. As someone who works with data professionally, Burge's process looks silly, not least because the author takes a highly developed question and then digs into new analysis as if no prior knowledge or work existed on the subject. It's already a ham-fisted approach, so it comes as no surprise to see Mr Burge divide his cohort into men and women, broken out by ethnicity, religion, education and income, observe a gap between the sexes, and then breathlessly arrive at the conclusion that men are the real problem here. Does that not sound right to you? Perhaps it doesn't match up with your lived experience. Maybe it sounds like it plays right into the woke narrative. Is the question even well posed? After all, what does men are the problem even mean? These are hard questions, but don't put them to Mr Burge. He didn't come to these conclusions. This was just the answer that the data provided him. And so confident is the author in the oracular power of the data that despite the very limited trends demonstrated, Mr Burge strengthens his conclusions as the article progresses, eventually asserting that the broad trend in family decline is caused by men walking away. It is not until the final paragraph that Mr Burge realises he is out over his analytical skis and retreats back to the typical refrain that more research is needed. So in conclusion, we have men are at fault, more research needed. Really, could you find a better preliminary conclusion for a successful progressive grant proposal in just seven words? Entire academic careers have been built on just repeating this conclusion over and over again. And if you could find a better way to sell these results as data-driven, you'd be made for life in a modern university. As readers might success, there are lots of mistakes going on in Mr Burge's analysis, most fundamentally that the author is treating his data set like it fell out of the sky. He doesn't know what a man is. He doesn't know what a woman is. He doesn't know what a marriage is. All of these data points are just numbers describing widgets from planet Zongo. And if there are more bad effects associated with the male widgets, that means that these male widgets caused the bad effects of their own volition. The core of Mr Burge's article comes down to just 
one graph, rehashed several times with adjustments, that shows a gap, suspiciously closed at each end, in the has-never-been-married measurement between men and women, with women having married more. From this graph, supposedly, we can discern evidence of a mass defection of the institution driven by men shirking their responsibilities. But Mr Burge's conclusions can't hold up to even a few moments of introspection. For instance, when I taught statistics, I used to tell my students to sanity check their results by looking at their graph, pointing to a position on it, and asking themselves, what is going on here in real life? What would such a method reveal about Mr Burge's data set? After all, his data describes something that we all understand from life. Real men, real women and real relationships. Quite obviously, on examining the family formation question this way, we would immediately realise that marriage is not an individual question, but a pair-matching process. Given that polygamy and gay marriage are still statistically rare in America at the time of the sample, virtually every marriage is a match between both a man and a woman, meaning that the sex differences that appear statistically in the has-ever-been-married category, must be the result of one of two effects. Women marrying men from outside the cohort, or women marrying and divorcing, with their ex-husbands remarrying never-before-married women. In either case, neither effect originates from the decisions of men who have never been married, and could not provide evidence of a mass shirking of marriage by single men. More to the point, if marriage did work, as Mr Burge implies, and its incidence was simply a matter of each party individually wanting it more, we could just as easily derive from the data the idea that women are the problem. Case in point, a recent Pew survey showed that young women are the more reluctant parties when it comes to future family formation. Nevertheless, the alternative conclusion that women are the problem would be equally silly. Neither men nor women can collectively be the problem in a market-matching game, at least in the way that Mr Burge is implying in his article. There could be a problem with how either side of the gender divide values marriages. There could be a problem with how each sex has set their standard for accepting mates. And the problem may be lopsided between the sexes. But you could never, even theoretically, derive this kind of conclusion from a data set describing just the incidence of marriage because, short of an explosion of bigamy or homosexuality, it takes two to tango. And Mr Burge's conclusion is made all the more strange by the fact that, in his haste to chase the ghost of male culpability, the author blows off the most notable element in his data set, pointing out and then sidestepping the conclusion that increased education makes men more likely to get married but has a neutral or negative effect on women's prospect for matrimony. This last conclusion won't be surprising to anyone who has explored the topic in more depth. And for those interested, I'd certainly recommend Aporia's in-depth investigation into the ultimate causes of the baby bust. However, this is not the point that I want to explore in this essay. The problem I see in the previous analysis is less a particular mistake interpreting data and more an underlying philosophical misunderstanding. In 2024, very few people have a good appreciation of what data models actually are. Subsequently, we increasingly see cargo cult statistics with people imitating the form of the process. For example, collecting data sets, generating R values, making graphs, with no understanding of the purpose or limitations of the endeavour. People demand data-driven analysis, but then just extract measurements and graphs from datasets and project their conclusions on them like oracles hovering over tea leaves. No greater criticism about the context or framing of the question is performed. It would be one thing to see this attitude isolated on some statistics blogs, but in the era of AI and machine learning, this error has captured our entire society. What went wrong? We need to start with a hard reality. 
There is no such thing as a data-driven decision. I know this goes against everything we are supposed to believe in our modern information age, and perhaps a reader would be surprised to hear this from me, considering I'm fond of reminding people the data is real and the model just a guess. But difficulties in complex analytics aside, one cannot simply fall back on pure observation, treating the data as a magic object and looking for some kind of answer to spring forward from its form like Athena from the head of Zeus. I know that a large number of my readers consider the subject of data analytics boring, but demystifying this practice is important, especially in 2024, when our ruling class is divided between process-obsessed legal autists, data-obsessed technical autists, and the large language models built from their cooperation. More often than not, whether it is machine learning, data mining, artificial intelligence, or even conclusions from statistics blogs, data analytics are performed like a magic trick. A shiny truth is dangled in front of the reader's eyes, while the magician smuggles deception after deception out of this linguistic hat. I think we need some more reflection on how exactly these tricks are done. At its core, data analytics is simply the process of translating a set of highly formalized observations that we call data into some expression in human language that we call true or useful. And at broad scale, analytics can be reduced to just three components, the model, the data, the frame. Briefly, I can explain each. First, the one that you hear the most about, it's the model, the engine of the analysis. A data model is usually expressed formally with mathematics and driven by computation, usually via a Turing machine. This includes pretty much anything that we ordinarily consider software, from regression analysis to the code running in your Excel spreadsheet or the large language model incorporated into Google or Microsoft's latest AI projects. The form is always the same. Observations and data go in and some programmed output comes out, trained by the model's assumptions to represent something about reality suited to the user's demands. Second, and more importantly, there is the data. Data is some historical record that an analyst considers a proxy for reality by assumption. Most commonly, this includes large matrices of labelled data and associated descriptive database entries. However, more generically, the data category would include the input parameters, the rules and heuristics that are fed into any given model. Third, there is the frame, sometimes called business requirements in industry. The frame defines the purpose, truth and validity of any combination of modeling and data. Not only does the frame impose arbitration on the result, it defines every axiom that is fed into the previous two components. What defines an effective model? What constitutes good logic? How do we deem that the data is true? What are the assumptions we are bringing to those observations implicitly? What will make a model's answer useful? Each of these questions must have answers, explicitly or implicitly, to provide the foundation for an analysis. In order to demystify the process of data models, it's important to understand that it's all just these three components, nothing more and nothing less. We talk constantly about algorithms, machine learning tools, computational frameworks and LLMs. Still, as everyone in the industry knows, the data is where the real power of analysis lies. The simplest algorithms can often infer good findings from an accurate and clear data set, while even the most complex models with the largest of computational cycles suffers from the garbage in, garbage out problem. Furthermore, almost no one talks about the model's frame, even though the frame controls everything the model generates and determines whether a project will be considered successful or not. This last observation might be hard for lay people to appreciate because the frame neither contains observations nor the computation of the analysis. The frame doesn't involve any state-of-the-art technology. There are no lines of code, neural network, 
parameters, GPUs. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, the frame will determine the quality of the answers that a system will generate. Even subtle variations on the type of question can lead to massively differentiated results. Subsequently, without a way of understanding the purpose of the question at the moral and intuitive level, no meaningful decision can be made. A classic example may illustrate this point. Sometime in the mid-1970s, a study was performed at UC Berkeley, showing that women were significantly less likely to be admitted into the school's graduate departments, even though men and women applicants had roughly comparable resumes. Was this clear evidence of unfairness against women? Perhaps. However, after further analysis, when admissions rates were examined at the department level, the exact opposite conclusion was reached. For each department across the board, women's admission rates were identical or even higher than their male counterparts. So based on the same data set, women were being under-admitted at the university level, but over-admitted in each department that made up the university. How did this make any sense? What the researchers had stumbled upon was a frustrating obstacle in translating statistics into human language, specifically the Simpsons paradox, where an effect can appear strongly in aggregate and then completely disappear in all subdivisions. In the Berkeley case study, what happened was a mismatch in each department's admission standards where the supply and demand of degrees and funding varied radically. Men disproportionately applied to departments with higher funding and graduate admission rates, for example engineering, and women disproportionately applied to departments with lower funding and fewer highly contested graduate positions, for example in the humanities. Under these circumstances, there was necessarily a larger number of female rejections, even when the individual departments preferred female applicants. So, the statistical mystery is solved, but how do these statistical measurements help us answer the original question of whether anything unfair was going on at the women's graduate admissions? All of the analysis has been given to us in two measurements, one microcosmic and one macrocosmic, each implying opposite conclusions. Which is the relevant quantity? Which is the signal and which is the noise? There is no formal or procedural way to answer this question from the data. It all depends on the frame we are using for the question. With a normal understanding of how graduate admissions work and a classic Western understanding of fairness, the department level measurement is the relevant statistic. Students are admitted via the individual department standards, so the lack of under-admission in each department would indicate no discrimination against females in the adjudication process. However, this conclusion is dependent on the moral assumption that fairness means a neutral standard of arbitration. From the perspective of equity, restorative justice, or crude feminism, a neutral standard would likely be irrelevant next to the existence of disparate outcomes or the emotional trauma suffered by women due to their greater rates of rejection. The frame, not the data, decides the issue. There is no such thing as intelligence without contextual experience, moral teleology and dynamic intuition. These qualities are injected into any data model via its frame and constitute whatever real intelligence the analysis provides. As such, the process of using data to come to good conclusions is at base experiential, intuitive and difficult, perhaps impossible to express formally. Ultimately, I believe this informal quality of intelligence to be the core reason that AI alignment is almost certainly impossible in concept. AI alignment, or the theoretical field of constraining future artificial intelligence with rules that limit its possible actions, suffers from 
a major technical hurdle insofar as it tries to constrain the infinite future potential of a system totally unlike anything we've ever seen behind a finite set of formal rules. This endeavour appears reminiscent of the perennial human folly of trying to contain the infinite in the finite. And although I certainly don't have a proof, I suspect that the AI alignment problem is directly analogous to its futility in the failed attempts at describing mathematical completeness or solving Turing's halting problem. However, at a more philosophical level, the AI alignment project embodies the same mistakes as Carlyle's government by steam. Organic systems cannot simply be scoped out of their context and replaced by a formal set of rules while still maintaining their ability to be lifelike. As Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park might put it, either the artificial life in question breaks free of its constraints and becomes actual life, or it is eventually stifled and killed by its confining rules. But this discussion about actual artificial intelligence is completely hypothetical in our own time, because everything we see now is just a variation of standard data analytics with whatever intelligence it demonstrates introduced to it externally via its frame. Moreover, to the extent that we mystify the technology treating large language models like silicon humans, or worse, silicon gods, humanity is setting itself up for disaster. I'm hoping that a certain amount of demystification may have occurred recently in the wake of a series of LLM fiascos most prominently by Google's Gemini image creator, which despite repeated requests to make images of European historical figures and citizens from predominantly European countries, just could not draw white people. What could cause advanced LLMs to do this? Was there some bug in the code? But it gets worse. Whatever assumptions about race equity and inclusion Google used to build their model also made the resulting text responses very open to genocidal sentiments, just as long as it was directed against the right white people. Google was ultimately forced to take notice of the problem when people requested pictures of mid-century Germans and the predictable images of black SS officers Gemini produced were deemed offensive to the African-American community. Perhaps the engineers need to adjust some parameters. Maybe Google needs to recalibrate its model on more historical data. But really, this fiasco should trigger a larger conversation as we contemplate the reality that Google tried to design an LLM with ungodly amounts of computational power to accurately and humanely represent history, but instead produced a machine that couldn't do anything but create false, bigoted, and eliminationist portrayals of the past. And everyone watching this disaster unfold knows full well that these insane responses coming out of Google's Gemini didn't spring spontaneously from a GPU cycle or coincidentally emerge from a misaligned neural network parameter. They were intentionally built into the system's framework by a management team who intended for Gemini to act less as a tool to represent history than as a weapon to systematically misinform its customer base and push Google's preferred politics agenda. Hey, Remember when Google's slogan was, don't be evil? What happened to that? It sounds similar to another slogan from IBM in the 70s. A computer can never be held accountable. Therefore, a computer must never make a management decision. Just like the don't be evil idea that Google floated in the early days, this notion about the impossibility of artificial accountability contains acute wisdom that modern society is doing everything in its power to forget. Why does this so frequently happen? Well, it's simple. Responsible use of technology isn't profitable. Incidentally, 
Google's Don't Be Evil slogan was an indirect reference to the founders' early intention not to sell or curate search results with promotional considerations, a practice that the creators felt would bias the information delivered by their search engine. However, as the company grew and the internet became the portal for all advertising attention, Google's leadership realised that to become the biggest thing online, it needed to monopolise and sell attention. So the change was made, the slogan was dropped, and now Google curates most information online, selling ads to the eyeballs it controls. There's a similar story behind other technologies of our era. Video games aren't really doing their job unless they are addictive, life-destroying time sinks. Social media isn't worthwhile unless it can replace real relationships and apply social control to its user base. Dating apps aren't profitable unless their users remain single and on the dating markets. I think we're in the process of discovering something very similar about this new AI technology. It will only be truly profitable if it can sell itself as something it is not accountable. However, once the fakery and magic are stripped away, it's just another computer model clinging to the data and parameters given to it by its creators. And people will only be impressed if they can envision the LLM like some masterful artificial being issuing authoritative truth in the name of science, born from incalculable processing power, data and energy. Just ignore the little men behind the curtains, pulling the levers and making the apparatus work. But that's the trick, isn't it? Understanding that machine learning doesn't actually replace human thought spoils the magic, because that would mean that human considerations have to be taken into account. That would mean that mankind's problems can't be solved with better algorithms running on ever faster GPUs. That would mean that science and technology aren't the answers to every problem, and that the government cannot be run by steam. But these conclusions would require actual accountability, and no one wants that. So expect to see more stale political platitudes recycled through LLMs, all giving variations of the response we heard earlier. Men are the problem. White people are the problem. Humans are the problem. More AI research is needed. And also expect to hear the usual excuses from management that this is just what the data told them to say. Despite what we hear from the AI optimists about machines gaining sentience, neither the algorithms nor their creators will ever gain accountability. There's no profit in it. Recently, my wife asked me if I thought AI was demonic. Perhaps not the strangest question, but I had difficulty giving her a good answer. To a degree, the consideration is more than a little silly, since I've been urging throughout the article that AI as we know it is simply an empty vessel. It only contains what we put into it. But does this understanding answer the question about AI's diabolical nature? For years... Even as a convert, I scoffed at the Catholic pretension that Ouija boards were a portal for demonic influence. After all, a spiritual complaint directed at an object that I'd known throughout my life as a board game seemed silly, echoing 80s paranoia about Dungeons and Dragons. But experience gradually taught me to be more cautious about the things that lie in those empty spaces where humans reach for spiritual forces they do not fully understand. You put your hands down on the board, feed it meaningless impulses, and receive an answer. Are you communing with dark spirits? Or is the board just reflecting what you put in? Does it even matter? After all, I don't know any greater darkness than the vicious, self-terminating thoughts that circulate in the human mind once it is divorced of the purpose and spiritual centre. And if wresting these dark subconscious feelings from the mind 
putting them on a pedestal and then divesting them of any accountability cannot rightfully be called demonic, then nothing can. But this fiendish end is exactly what our society has elected to pursue, if not through the veil of sorcery, then through the veil of self-deceptive technology. What first began as a perverse business model and twisted political ideology thus re-emerges as a demonic death cult, with each bad decision magnified as it is put on the altar of computational power. But shouldn't we have expected this? Modernity put man's soul in a box, removed his judgment, and sold his religion for any false promise sufficiently self-flattering. Are we really surprised now, when the horned adversary steps forward to claim his due? Nothing good can come from these developments. While science may never invent a species-destroying AI basilisk, the machine learning revolution will likely succeed in accelerating our regularly scheduled civilizational decline by transferring the collapsing trust in experts to a collapsing trust in technology itself. Then, when the bad decisions built into this system overflow, when our society burns and everyone stumbles out of their illusions of progress, those who come after will find it difficult to know who to blame. One might point a finger at the men who set the machine in motion, the leaders who ignored wisdom in favour of expediency. One may even ask them why they decided to hand over humanity's future to an endeavour so transparently foolish. But I already know what their answer will be. The data made us do it. <laughs>